Hi everyone. I'm here today with another, well, sort of political book, but more in a cultural or sociological sense that inherently has a bearing on politics, but also involves a discussion beyond just our stereotypical left-right divide. Um, although there is a little bit of that as well, so for full disclosure, uh, I, I lean a bit to the left in the American political landscape, but in reading this book I'm just trying to grapple with the ideas in it more than to identify with one side or the other. So what is this book? It's The Coddling of the American Mind by Jonathan Haidt and Greg Lukianoff. Haidt himself is sort of a centrist on the political spectrum, and I've previously read his book The Righteous Mind, which I highly recommend. In that book, uh, Haidt tries to understand how people form their political or ideological opinions, and how two people with seemingly diametric political views can still each think of themselves as good people. Haidt argues there that it's not because one or both of them is simply delusional, it rather has more to do with the slightly different but not entirely different values that these people hold, values that they then use to rationalize their gut reactions and intuitions about how the world works, or should work, uh, in an imperfect way though that often leads different people to use the same values to support entirely different intuitions. As for this book, well, I didn't find it as good as Haidt's other book, but nevertheless it has some ideas in it that I think are really important to think about. This 2018 book was apparently expanded from an essay that they published in The Atlantic in 2015, which I didn't learn about until after reading the book, and that essay suffers even more from some of my criticisms that I'll point out in this video by eschewing a nuanced sort of dissection of these themes to fit them in a digestible lunch break reading format, so unfortunately I can't really recommend it as a substitute for the slightly less sensational version that's provided in this book. Still, I'm going to link that in the video description below. But anyway, in both the book and the essay, Haidt and his co-author Greg Lukianoff, another frequent essayist and political commentator, name and take aim right from the start at three great untruths, to use their words, uh, growing in American society today, which they argue have led to the coddling of the American mind, and created a culture that they call safetyism, one in which feeling safe is prioritized too highly, often ultimately at the expense of ourselves and of others. And in general I agree with them here, but I also think that this book contains too many generalizations and not enough nuance in trying to fit a lot of complicated ideas and events within their framework of three great untruths, and in its worst moments I feel like they're not making a good faith effort to really understand the rationale behind some of the practices they criticize or the contexts in which these practices might actually be acceptable. Therefore, I don't always fully agree with the extent to which they th criticize these views or all situations to which they apply them. First though, what are these three great untruths? Each of them is a short aphorism, or maybe an anti-aphorism. First, what doesn't kill you makes you weaker. Second, always trust your feelings. And third, life is a battle between good people and evil people. I think the first two of these three great untruths are more naturally related than the third, although you'll sort of see where the third fits into eventually. To put simply a much more detailed thesis, the authors basically suggest that today in universities and increasingly in liberal spheres of society, by extension, a certain well-intentioned efforts to make college and in general society a more welcoming place for everyone are actually harming today's youth. And I'll just throw myself in this ring as well since I too am a product of this generation of ideas. They do this by creating an habitual environment of overprotection, making us emotionally fragile and having other negative effects as well, such as stifling intellectual debate. Under this umbrella, they lump several already pretty broad ideas, including trigger warnings and safe spaces. Do I agree with this general claim before getting into the nitty gritty specifics? Well, yes, I do, which is why I found this book interesting and decided to read it. I also just want to reiterate that this book is not two writers on the right side of the political spectrum taking cheap shots at the left or at universities. The writers are politically in the center and left of center, um, and their criticisms are not really criticisms of the left per se. For example, I and many others who lean more towards the left side of the political spectrum have also taken issue with some of these trends which many argue are not really liberal in the true sense of the word, even if they are embraced by the so-called cultural left. Part of the reason I found the premise of this book really intriguing is that I've kind of come to similar broad conclusions from my own experiences. Although I'm not really as critical of the idea of trigger warnings as the authors are, I have found myself kind of surprised, or perhaps should I say confused, at the extent to which active and categorical avoidance of, say, triggering situations has become encouraged in mainstream liberal society nowadays. The dissonance was amplified when I myself a few years ago found myself dealing with some pretty serious anxiety and obsessive fears that really drove me into some pretty serious depression. 
I, like one of the authors in the book, Greg Lukianoff, was introduced by necessity to the idea of cognitive behavioral therapy and the related idea of exposure therapy. The core underpinning of exposure therapy basically is the somewhat counterintuitive idea that the best way to overcome a fear or a disturbing feeling or thought is not to avoid it, which ultimately just makes you more afraid of the thing by reinforcing the idea that you're too weak to handle it, uh, but rather the best way to deal with it is to seek it out and experience it so that your brain can really learn that it's not quite as harmful to you as you think it is. This type of therapy seems to refute the first and second of the great untruths, what doesn't kill you makes you weaker, and always trust your feelings. And in my experience, this exposure therapy and related things like cognitive behavioral therapy really have worked for me in a huge way, and they're like now a huge part of how I understand my life. I specifically try to notice when I'm unconsciously avoiding things that make me uncomfortable in a way that makes them more difficult for me. So Haidt and Lukianoff suggest that trigger warnings and safe spaces, for example, are reinforcing the idea that what doesn't kill you makes you weaker and making us all more emotionally fragile. I am sympathetic to this argument, though not quite to the extent that they suggest. You see, I do think that these ideas are often taken to an extreme that is unhealthy and unproductive, and thus to designate a whole campus, or even a classroom for that matter, as a safe space and put certain sensitive topics off limits or to avoid grappling with certain opposing points of view is doing us a disservice and not really making anyone safer even if it might temporarily feel that way. At the same time, people who have been through traumatic experiences, and I'm fortunate not to have been through anything really traumatic myself, but even also people who are emotionally struggling need to confront our fears and process our experiences in a controlled way. I, I mean, it's not helpful to confront your fears in a setting where you're going to get really worked up about them and just feel like you actually are in danger, even though you're probably not, um, and then just end up further reinforcing your fear responses. For me, I've kind of learned that I can open up to challenging feelings a little bit at a time, but sometimes jumping in all at once unprepared can leave me feeling overwhelmed and frustrated and thus just makes things more difficult in the short term. Thus, it seems very appropriate to have safe spaces where people can move at their own chosen pace, as long as the people in these spaces are not treated too much as fragile and are encouraged to see that they can confront their challenges, even if they seem insurmountable in the moment. And I realize the very idea of a trigger warning or a safe space as described in this context can be sort of vague because they, they are, and they have been used for many different situations, some which I think could be harmful to us, and others in which I think they seem quite reasonable and beneficial. But this level of generality is also present throughout the book, so you're not going to get a great idea of the nuance that might exist in these terms from this book. They also throw in the topic of microaggressions in the ring, which I personally don't really think belongs under the same umbrella. To define that term really quickly in case you're not familiar, they mean small things that, for example, I might do or say when I'm around, for example, a black person that make that person feel unwelcome or like they don't belong. An example would be walking through a university building and approaching a black person and telling them there's a leaky pipe in the restroom sink, so assuming that this person is a janitor based on their skin color. Uh, there is sort of a reason for the assumption since the present reality is that unfortunately most people in the university buildings are white, but it also is probably going to make that person feel out of place uh, if they're actually, say, a graduate student or even a professor who works in this building. Now, I certainly agree with authors that if you're a member of some minority and you go around with a mentality of looking for microaggressions everywhere and viewing the world as hostile, then you will sometimes see them where there was no intentional affront. And even if there was, it might not be healthy to think about things this way all the time. At the same time, I found this portrayal of the topic of microaggressions pretty disappointing because, yes, I agree that sometimes I am bound to accidentally do things that, say, someone of a racial minority or someone who is a woman will perceive as an affront, even if that wasn't my intention. And yet, doesn't it only seem reasonable and fair to be aware myself of what these things are? Not in a nitpicky sort of way, but in a sort of way such as not assuming that every racial minority I see in a university building is a janitor. Probably because I should be conscious not to do these things that some people constantly have to put up with and make them feel belittled. And partly also just so that I am aware of what an experience might be like for someone other than myself. Like, to me, it's not about who's right here. It's not about judging whether someone's experience is valid or not. It's just being aware of what that experience is so that I can be sensitive and, you know, just be a decent person. So I thought the discussion of this topic in the book was frankly pretty bad. They then take on the topic of call-out culture, which is now more commonly known as cancel culture and has received a lot of attention in the media. Again, I think this is a topic that involves quite a bit of nuance in discussing, which we don't always get in the public discourse, and we really don't get in this book either. 
I have to give the authors a bit of a pass in some regards because of the discussion around cancel culture, including the obfuscation of the very term and some pushback about where it does and doesn't apply, these have really taken off in the time since this book was published. Neither cancel culture nor call-out culture was referenced in the original 2015 essay, so they themselves were new for the 2018 book. Canceling is indeed a broad term, but here the authors are mainly referring to practices where, in most cases, university students engage on social media or public calling out of people whose views they find objectionable. And basically, the authors argue here that cancel culture or call-out culture is often being used as a tactic for the cancelers to refuse to engage on an intellectual level with ideas that they find challenging. By avoiding a conversation or debate with someone whose ideas we disagree with, we also avoid a situation in which our values and beliefs about the world may be challenged in a way that we find uncomfortable. And this is often done by claiming a moral high ground and is done by people who may not have even grappled critically with the ideas that they're condemning or thought about whether the person they're condemning truly is advocating these ideas. On some level, I agree with them here. I think especially if someone is espousing a view that's not really a fringe view, but actually a view or perspective held by a lot of people in this country, then whether we find it objectionable or offensive or whatever, refusing to engage with this person or this group is not going to get us anywhere. I also agree that cancel or call out culture can often exploit social media to create a mob mentality in which a few influential leaders indict a public figure and incite thousands or even millions of followers to cancel this person by essentially governing how the public perceives and responds to a statement or event, rather than encouraging people to think critically and form their own opinions, nuanced opinions, ideally. So this, in fact, seems to be the rationale for the third of the great untruths uh, mentioned by Haydn Lukianov. Life is a battle between good people and evil people. Certainly, I can think of examples, including some of the ones the authors describe in the book, in which someone was condemned prematurely and even lost their job for reasons that I disagree with, uh, despite often agreeing with the spirit of the canceler's criticism. On the other hand, I think the authors are also too dismissive of the reasons for why such a culture has emerged, some of which have very little to do with the need for overprotection. Take the Me Too movement, which was one of the most prominent examples of call-out culture in which lots of women who for a while had felt unable to speak about their own sexual assaults at the hands of uh, some prominent and famous men together came out and told their stories and specifically called out some of these men. Now, we could quibble about whether every single one of these accusations was credible, but I'm going to accept that a whole lot of them were, and I think this was a powerful movement with a profound cultural influence. Thus, cancel culture arises not only out of a need for safety, but also as a way for people who feel powerless to be heard, and to effectively wield very great power in some circumstances, power that I think has been used for both positive ends and for more questionable and harmful purposes. That's all I'm going to say on this section, because I'm sure by now entire books have been written about this, and I don't think that it was done full justice in this book, although it was explored at least on a surface level. The authors discuss how the results of these great untruths are a culture of safetyism, a tendency to feel like it's other people's problem when we don't feel safe, whether that means physically safe or just intellectually safe, which I agree is not typically a healthy culture to have. And then in the last several chapters of the book, they talk about how safetyism has affected various aspects of society. They mention the polarization of politics, as people tend to start viewing things even more as battles between good and evil, although this is of course going to be a fairly limited discussion of a phenomenon that has been written about quite widely lately, particularly following the election of Trump in 2016, which really shocked many who had no idea it was coming. Well, for others, it seemed totally natural. They talk about how fear instilled in parents has led to overparenting and generally allowing kids to do a lot less growing than they used to be able to, which then feeds back into their own emotional fragility and tendency to seek protection from a seemingly dangerous world. And then there's also a fair amount of talk about how phones and social networks are contributing to these problems, which I didn't find interesting or particularly convincing because it seems to be plausible but hardly proven or supported with the stuff that they provide here. And thus I found it somewhere out of place in an otherwise pretty cohesive book, although it's possible I just missed the real connection here. So many of the topics in this book are immensely important, but at the same time I have some pretty serious criticisms of the way certain topics are handled in a way that, in my opinion, lacks sufficient nuance and doesn't really do full justice to some of the ideas that the authors are criticizing as maladaptive. Further, depending how you read the commentary on various controversial events, you might understand the author's criticism of phenomena such as hyperattention to microaggressions and call-out culture 
as actually disagreeing with the general views espoused by, for example, people protesting for social change and equality. And it's difficult because if you view the author's description in that way, I have to say you're kind of right, I think. I mean, in many cases, the authors do come across as unduly critical, for example, of the very idea of microaggressions, portraying the way they're discussed in a way that seems too dismissive. On the other hand, it's important when reading this book just to keep in mind, for example, that when they decry the tendency of mostly left-wing students to disinvite controversial speakers from talking on campus and to respond to these would-be guests as if merely letting them speak is an act of violence in itself, this doesn't mean they're actually endorsing all these speakers' views. It just means they believe it's important to let people engage with difficult and flat-out wrong and hateful ideas rather than to just lobby to get them shut down. Now, I feel like this review ended up being a little bit more negative than I thought it would be. I really did enjoy reading this book and thinking about the ideas in it. I just also think it could have been done so much better. In any case, that's a wrap for this book. If you made it this far, don't forget to like and subscribe. And until next time, bye and happy reading.